Uh, my last name is pronounced Laguesse. I don't expect you to remember that. Um, I do love the, either the brackets or the non-breaking space in BibTeX. I get cited as Guess, comma, CL a lot, which makes my poor late grandfather roll over in his grave, um, which is too bad. Uh, as intimated, my research is in software engineering. I'm a professor. Um, and I noticed, trolling through the archives of papers we love, that there is sort of a tragic underrepresentation of software engineering research. Um, and I don't know if that's because of or in spite of kind of the overlap between academic, academia and industry that this kind of gathering represents, but hopefully we can rectify it a little bit. Um, in particular, I care about software quality. So how can we build and maintain and improve and assure real software, the software that we use and that we're all writing every day? Uh, and I actually do work in this area. Um, and I know that that kind of is counter a little bit to the ethos of the event to talk about my own work in the context of other people's work. Um, and I'm sorry about that. Um, the talk I gave that caused the invitation to happen was actually sort of about similar stuff. Um, and I thought I could make it up to you by having a bit more insight of the progression of the field and maybe some stories that never made it to print and so that you will forgive me. Um, before I get to particular approaches, I want to start by laying out the problem domain. So what is it that all of these approaches are targeting? Um, note that I, I started with three papers. We'll see if we get to three. Uh, we'll definitely get to two, but the third, I'll speed up or something. Um, but I'm going to set the problem domain by telling you a story. Um, and it's, in fact, a true story of why I went to grad school. So once upon a time, I was young. Uh, this is me, young, right, young Claire. Um, I graduated from college, and I got a job as a software engineer. Um, right away, I didn't go to grad school. Um, and I worked in a division of a large company, and it had an existing product, and I was added to that product. So it had a lot of code already. It had been under active development for a number of years. Um, and that means that it did a lot of stuff, right? It had features. We sold it to people. They used it. It had a regression test suite that ran overnight. It's a piece of software, right? In this organization, every developer had to go on bug duty every six weeks. So what that meant is that once every six weeks, you were in charge of fixing one or more bugs. There was at least one input, one regression test, one bug report from a customer or developer that was causing the software to do something weird, and it was our job to fix it. So the bug that sent me back to grad school <laughs> was from a customer. And a Ukrainian customer, which is relevant because the product I worked on was a large XML compiler, XSLT compiler, that processed data on a network very quickly. And a Ukrainian customer has a lot of data in Ukrainian, which is a language that's written with a Cyrillic character set. And somewhere in the transition from 32 to 64 bits, you can imagine when I graduated from college, something went weird in our handling of 64-bit Ukrainian Unicode. So if there's one nice thing that can be said about this bug is that it, it's actually pretty easy to describe at a high enough level for you to understand the story, and also that it was really easy to reproduce, because all you had to do was give the appliance Ukrainian data and then run it in a 64-bit environment and watch the garbage fire break out, right? Um, it took about three days to fix, because I had to then understand the Unicode for 64-bit Ukrainian. Um, but you know, actually just describing it and reproducing it was pretty simple. This is the fundamental problem in source level automatic defect repair or patch generation. We have a program and it's doing some stuff correctly. It's a real world program that somebody's working on right now. It's PowerPoint, it's whatever. Um, it has to be doing at least one thing incorrectly. This is true of all software. Bugs are an enormous problem. Um, in the wild, in software engineering practice, we might find a bug in any number of ways or we might validate correctness in any number of ways. Um, but in research practice in this area, we're using test cases right now to witness correct versus incorrect behavior. So when I say it's doing something wrong, I mean that there's a test case that it's failing, but we could tell if it was passing. My job as an engineer was to take that input, learn something about the program, and create a small number of changes that when applied to the input program produce something very, very similar that did all the same things, but with that bug corrected. So the goal in automatic program repair, any paper you read on this subject, is to develop techniques that can produce those patches automatically, improving the quality of our software, and freeing developers like me from the burden of three days of Ukrainian Unicode. I'm telling you this story um, because I think that there's a slightly different perspective that we are taking from a software engineering research point of view in this kind of work than you might have encountered if you're reading more um, programming languages or analysis or security work. They're doing really cool and important stuff in addressing 
whole classes of defects, right? Can we make it so that we never have a buffer overflow ever again? Can we prevent control hijacking attacks? And that work is important, and it's shipping in modern software, but it's not at all the kind of approach that we're taking in the software engineering community when it comes to fixing bugs automatically. Here we have a much more general developer-facing use case. There is a bug, it is bad, and I want it fixed. I couldn't tell my boss, no, I'm sorry, I only fix buffer overflows, and this doesn't look like one, right? I said, I've got a bug report, and I want it fixed. So this area of research has had quite a bit of attention in the last five to 10 years especially, um, and there's a wide variety between the different approaches that have been proposed. Uh, but from 30,000 feet, they're all basically the same. Um, they follow the same three steps to try and patch a bug. And in fact, they're very similar to the steps that a human developer takes as well. So step one is you need to localize the bug to some smaller unit of the program. You need to find the function it's in, the line of code, whatever. Um, and you might do a little bit of analysis at that point, either static or dynamic, to understand the bug, right, to come up with a way to fix it. Then any technique will have some set of strategies that it takes to create fixed possibilities, right, templates or edit templates or something like that, that they will recombine or create or instantiate to make one or more possible patches, which they will then try and validate to find one that does the trick. Two of these steps, I said from 10, 30,000 feet, everything's the same. Actually, closer to the ground, two of these steps are also the same in every technique you could possibly read. Um, step three, validating candidate patches. Right now, we're all using tests. I'm hoping this is making the people who actually develop in the audience uncomfortable, because it should be. Um, we're going to come back to this. The first step, though, is also very, very similar um, between all different techniques that try and fix patches automatically. Um, bug localization or fault localization is an area of research in program analysis in its own right, and so program repair research just punts to the existing literature on this and reuses techniques that have been proposed by others. Um, if you've not been exposed to this kind of work before, it's not that important that you understand the particulars. I can give you the intuition by calling back to how any of us fix bugs. So we'll do that quick, and then we won't have to talk about it much ever again. Um, when I face down that Ukrainian bug, I'm going to have an honesty moment with you, the audience, and tell you what's the first thing I did. Um, and it's the first thing that you would have done. I applied that first analysis that any of us ever learned, right? <laughs> I put in a bunch of printfs. And I did that because if you run a program full of logging on its test cases and look at the output, you can just see what was executed, right? And that tells you something. Because if something's executed on the failing test case but not the passing test case, then maybe the bug is near there. This is more or less what spectrum-based fault localization techniques are doing, um, except automatically and with significantly better math. They take the program in its test case, they run it, they see what's executed, and then they do some computation to figure out which techniques, which pieces of the program are most likely to be associated with the bug. So it's nice because it gives you pieces of program and like a numerical ranking or a numerical score indicating bugginess. And we just use that because we can only solve one problem at a time and they are working on it, which is good. So the real variation here is actually in the second bullet um, where we come up with different ways to try and change the program. Um, from 10,000 feet, I said from 30,000 feet, they're all the same. From 10,000 feet, the techniques in this space split into sort of two conceptual threads. And the first two papers I listed um, to go along with this talk are a prototypical approach from each of those threads, which is why I picked them. Um, the first set of techniques are what we call heuristic. They're also referred to as generate and validate, um, or even just guess and check approaches. We've got some kind of typically syntactic templates that will apply to the program. We'll generate a whole bunch of possibilities and then see if they work. Some of these are randomized techniques. The technique I'll be telling you about uses a stochastic element, but they, they can be deterministic. The point is just that they don't use any kind of symbolic reasoning and they construct many candidate patches. The symbolic reasoning is what's done in the second set of techniques, so those semantic <coughs> techniques that will use things like symbolic execution um, and theorem provers to try and construct code that has certain properties to fix a bug. So that's why I picked the first two papers. Um, this has been kind of the thread for the last five to 10 years. These two, you know, never the two shall meet, right? This vast divide. Um, but lately, and I'm actually, I've, I've confirmed this intuition. I've had this intuition that they're coming back together, um, that we're getting a little bit of the best of both worlds. Um, I've confirmed that with people in both the semantic and heuristic communities that I'm not insane on that observation. So the third paper, which we may or may not get to, we'll see how many stories I tell, um, is beginning to bring those two threads together. But let's start with the heuristic and semantic techniques I want to tell you about. 
So the first technique is called GenProg. GenProg either stands for genetic programming or for generic program repair, depending on who you ask and when. Uh, we continue to debate what the name that we came up with means. Um, one of these days it will be settled. Um, it uses evolutionary computation to fix bugs. So the one sentence summary is that it's conducting a biased random search for edits at the abstract syntax tree level of a program to fix a given bug without breaking anything else. Um, so it's using randomness, right? Now the search space of possible patches for a particular bug is trivially infinite. Um, so the real goal here is to manage that search space and traverse it in a way that, that's tractable. Right? And random search can be good for that kind of problem if you have enough domain assumptions that you can restrict the space in an intelligent way so you'll finish sometime before the heat death of the universe. Now, if you want to search for something randomly, you actually have a whole bunch of options available to you. Um, we've used genetic programming. That's what GenProg is using under the hood. Um, that's just the application of evolutionary <coughs> algorithms to program source code where those evolutionary algorithms are based on the principles that underlie biological evolution. This is one of those algorithms that people get really religious about. Um, you either love it or you hate it. Um, I've had people yell at me in public because I use the words genetic programming in a talk like this. Um, and it really upsets people. Um, but the thing about genetic programming is that it's really just a kind of a reasonable strategy to take in this problem because we treat programs as trees. And the literature on genetic programming has a lot of understanding of how to manipulate programs as trees and tree-based you know, uh, mutation and so on. So it's actually it's imperfect for a number of reasons, and I might highlight a few of those later, but we're just using it because its assumptions fit the problem domain, not because I'm religious either way on the subject. So you can yell at me if you want, but it's gonna have no impact on my behavior. <laughs> um, hasn't yet. So here's a diagram to show you roughly how this works. As usual, we have this input, right, program test cases. We need the passing test cases because we want to make sure we don't break anything. Again, we will come back to that. Um, evolutionary computation is a population-based approach, so that means it generates a number of candidate solutions to the problem at hand, and then it iteratively refines and improves that population looking for a variant that actually solves the problem. So each candidate is, evolved, is evaluated for its fitness to see how suitable it is, how likely it is to reproduce and make it to the next generation to call back to our biological analogy. Um, in this context, again, how many tests does the patched program pass? The good ones are maintained for continued evolution and recombination. The really bad ones, like the ones that move variables out of scope, for example, that don't compile are discarded. And we're looking for something in a reasonable amount of time that causes the program to pass all of the test cases. The nice thing about manipulating a program at the abstract syntax tree level, as you'll see, is that we'll never make a program that doesn't compile for syntax reasons, um, but we may move a label to a place where it has a redundant label, for example, at which point the, there, there are actually ways to make GCC complain that aren't just syntax. Um, you can preclude most of them. But the nice thing about manipulating programs at abstract syntax tree level is that we avoid a whole lot of compile compilation failures, which is good. So the particulars as they fit in this framework are that GenProg is localizing defects to statements. And by statements, I mean the grammar non-terminal in the C programming language. I'll show you what this means in a second. And then uses that genetic programming to traverse the space of statement level edits that reuse code from within the same program to try and fix the bug. So to spare you more text, I'll just show you what I mean. Um, here's a program. It's not the same program as was in the paper. It happens to be shorter and fits better on a slide. Um, <laughs> it is an implementation of Euclid's greatest common divisor algorithm. Spoiler alert, it has a bug. Um, in particular, if you give it A being zero, it will loop forever. And we can show you this by testing it. Um, so on regular inputs, it does the appropriate thing, right? It prints out two and then it exits. And we get bigger numbers, right? Oh, look, it's succeeding. But if we give it that first number being zero, it will print out the right answer and then it will loop forever. And the reason it's looping forever is because if you subtract zero from B forever, uh, B will never change. Now this is easy to fix, right? We just put a return statement between lines three and four, but it's you know, helpful to illustrate what we're trying to do with GenProg, so I will show you what I mean. It's also the first bug we ever fixed with GenProg, actually. Fun fact. Now the more theoretically minded will tell me, but Claire, how can you tell that the, program's not, it, the program is not going to halt, right? I hear there's a problem with that. Um, and I say yes, but I might have a quality requirement on my computation of greatest common divisor that says it should take fewer than five minutes to come up with a reasonable answer, at which point I can impose a timeout. And then it can still fail that test case, right? It needs to print out the correct answer and conclude. Now you may think I'm nuts, 
for this, but I will point out that the original implementation of MakeNode on Unix systems actually computed the greatest common divisor uh, between two numbers to um, figure out the appropriate block size. Um, CAT did as well, so I'm not completely bonkers. But really, the reason we use this is because it fits on a slide. So. so the first thing I said is that we're doing everything at the statement level. So that means that the program internally looks something like this. This is the level at which, the granularity level at which the program will be modified. So this means that GenProg is not trying to change things like the conditions inside the expression checks, the guards on the if statements or the loops. Um, it won't try and modify individual variables, but it will be moving statements around at roughly this level of granularity. And we do that because it reduces the number of possible edits, making that search space a little bit more tractable while still being relatively expressive. We use off-the-shelf fault localization to identify which regions are most likely to be associated with the bug. This further reduces the search space and biases it towards the code that's most likely to be buggy. So I've colored the red blocks here are the ones that are only executed by the failing test case. The green ones we're never gonna try and change because the failing test case never executes them, so why bother? So I had some drama with myself um, when preparing this talk because a key consideration when you're applying search to a new domain like this is how you represent candidate solutions. What is the thing in this box? In the paper that I gave you, which I picked because um, I think it tells a nice complete story and it's kind of accessible to a, a, a sort of broader technical audience, each one of these individuals was a modified version of the input program. So we were evolving a buggy version of a program into a fixed version of itself, which is sort of evocative and it's poetic and it fits the analogy and it totally doesn't scale because you're keeping around something like 50 copies of the PHP interpreter, um, which is sort of a silly thing to do. So I thought I'd just tell you the, how we're doing it now um, because a lot of the underlying assumptions are still the same. Um, and then I'm not lying to you, but if it sounds different from what we said in the paper, it's because it is. So in the intervening years, we changed this representation, that's what I'm trying to tell you, such that an individual is a candidate patch or set of changes to the input program. It has roughly the same expressive power, it happens to be more efficient than having every individual be an evolved program. But everything else is more or less the same. Um, a patch is just a series of statement level edits, so we can delete a statement, we can replace it or swap it with something else, or we can append a new statement in a place. If we're replacing code or we're inserting new code, we're taking that code from somewhere else in the same program. Um, this leverages the fact that's been observed in empirical practice that although developers do make mistakes, otherwise there'd be no point to this talk, um, for the most part, actually, they usually do things correctly. So if I forgot a null check somewhere, I probably didn't forget it everywhere. It was probably just that one weird corner case. So looking within the same program for code that does the right thing is, actually a pretty reasonable restriction, and again, reduces the search space versus having to generate every possible piece of C fragment code that you could ever want. So to mutate an individual or just make a new one, you just add new random edits to a given patch. And to combine them, you take edits from one patch and you put it with another. And all of that is guided by the fault localization. So to see how this plays out, if we want to create a new single edit patch to this program, we want to start by picking a random location guided by the fault localization. So if we get really lucky, let's say we picked this printf, and then we want to pick a random edit to apply. I'll show you insert. The others follow really naturally, right? Um, we just need some code now to insert. I took away the colors because the fault localization weights may not be usefully informative on picking correct code, right? Just the incorrect code. And this is a problem that's sort of started calling fixed localization is totally 100% unsolved. Um, in GenProg right now, we basically pick it at random sort of uniformly. Other people have tried different stuff. I don't think anyone has the definitive solution. But if we imagine we get super lucky and pick that return statement, the individual variant now is just one edit, insert return after printf on line three. And to evaluate it, we actually just apply that patch to the original program. We get a new abstract syntax tree. The great thing about abstract syntax trees, they can always be reified as source code. We can print it out, compile it, and run it on the test case um, and see if it works which it does, because I got lucky, because it's my talk, <laughs> and I can do that. So that's the big picture of how we use evolutionary computation to explore the space of candidate patches to a program at the abstract syntax tree level. Um, I will get into results in a minute, because it's a nice story, but I need to sh you know, show you that we can patch things. But before I do that, I actually want to introduce the second technique that I really want to talk about in some detail, Angelic, so you can really appreciate the contrast between semantic and heuristic approaches, and then we can discuss the results for them together. 
So the second paper is about a technique called Angelix. It was very recently published um, in May of 2016. Um, it's an iteration in the semantic body of work on program repair. Um, I totally fangirl this work. I'm like a little bit embarrassing about it. Um, so I'm, I love that I'm speaking at a place called Papers We Love about this paper that I really genuinely love. And hopefully I will be able to tell you why. So if you haven't read it, although I'm sure you all did, um, you will read it. Or you can read it again and appreciate it. Um, so within this same framework, right, we're all doing the same thing. Angelix is also localizing based on test cases, but there are a couple of key differences. Um, the most important one being that Angelix is localizing the bug to expressions. And not just any expressions, actually, but just the right-hand side of assignments and conditionals. I'll show you what I mean. Um, but first, I want to shout out Avek Rachuri. He's at the National University of Singapore. He shared a bunch of, he's the main PI in most of this work, and he shared with me a bunch of slides to help me get started. Um, this made my life way easier because animating symbolic execution in slides is, is really, frankly, tedious. Um, so in addition to being a really awesome scientist who does super cool work, he's also a really nice guy who made my life a lot easier this week. So cheers to him. That said, here's some source code that I do not want you to try and understand because it doesn't matter. What matters is that line four is wrong. What it should read is bias equals upset plus 100. Angelix is only going to try and fix expressions in if conditions and right-hand sides of assignments. Those are the things that are bolded, that mercifully show up on the screen. That makes me happy. So we can use test cases, right? We have some test cases to localize to particular expressions that are most likely associated with the fault. Um, and in particular, the existing work in spectrum-based fault localization can identify this line as faulty pretty easily. So that's the line that we're going to try and fix. There are two major things that Angelix does to do that. Um, what it's going to try and do, if you look at this line, it's going to say, okay, that whatever bias is being assigned to is wrong, so let's figure out what it should be instead. It first uses guided symbolic or concolic execution, depending who you ask, to find expression values that will make the test pass and then synthesis to construct replacement code that produces those values. So the name Angelix um, I, comes from the idea of this angelic value. So we say that an expression's angelic value is the value that would make a given test case pass if the expression had that value when it was executed. This value is set arbitrarily. That's the word that is often used in the literature. Um, and by arbitrarily, we actually just mean symbolically. So you can solve for a symbolic value, right? If you say, okay, instead of bias gets down set, bias gets x. Let's solve for x. And that's basically what they do. They collect the test case's input and expected output, and then a set of conditions that controlled a particular execution in terms of that symbolic value. So you start by executing the test concretely, and at the point that the execution depends on the symbolic value, you convert to symbolic execution to collect constraints over the execution um, just when the angelic value starts to matter. And then we'll use that in a cool way in a couple of slides. I'll show you the intuition on a single expression and a single test case. Um, one thing that makes Angelix awesome is that it can reason over multiple expressions at the same time, um, but the intuition generalizes from one, so I'll just show you one because it's easier. So if we set bias to, let's say, alpha, and we worry about just one test case, which is what we're doing here, um, we're going to start executing the code on this test case. So for the first three lines, nothing changes from the concrete execution, um, because it can just be executed concretely, because everything has a concrete value. But when we get to line four, now all of a sudden, we've entered the symbolic world. Bias doesn't have a concrete value. It has this arbitrary value. The path condition so far that is controlled this execution is just true because the condition on line three concretely evaluated to true. So now we keep executing, but now we're in a symbolic world. And so when we get to line six, bias doesn't have a concrete value right now, right? Bias is just alpha. We don't know what alpha is. We don't have any constraints on alpha that tells us whether or not it's greater than or equal to or less than downsep. So this could be true, right? And if this is true, then on line seven, we return one. And if we return one on line seven, it's because bias is equal to this arbitrary value. It hasn't been changed. Um, and the path condition is that that alpha is greater than 110, which is the concrete value of downsep on line six. Moreover, because we know what the expected output should be, we know that this corresponds to a passing execution. And that's useful because we can remember it. But again, we don't know if that 
evaluation on line six was going to evaluate to true. So what if it didn't? Well, that means that we're actually advancing to line eight instead. There's this other fork that execution could take. And in that case, bias is still alpha, but we know alpha has to be less than or equal to 110. But we also know that returning one here is wrong, right? So this execution is incorrect. If you ever read any paper that uses symbolic execution for anything, it probably has this tree in it. Um, maybe not this tree, but there's always this tree of executions. And that's what symbolic execution is computing, that full set of paths that could happen. Um, loops are a different story that you can ask me about at the break. So why do we do that, right? Okay, well we did that because if instead of bias just being a number, right, a symbolic value or a number, if we could set it to some arbitrary mathematical function, let's call it f, and that function has access to all of the in-scope variables, like inhibit, upsep, and downsep, we know that on this input, if it returns a number greater than 110, the text execution paths, passes, passes, path passes, otherwise it fails. And this is awesome, because we can collect all of the constraints over that function over all of the test cases and then concatenate them together. Now all we need is a function that satisfies those constraints. So where are we going to get it? That's kind of the next question. We use that guide to symbolic execution to get the constraints. Now step two is to solve those constraints with some kind of function. We want to concatenate them over all of the test cases so that we don't just pass the one test case, we pass all of them. <coughs> you have a bunch of options if you want to start synthesizing functions. It turns out um, they happen to use something called Oracle Guided Component-Based Program Synthesis to construct a satisfying F. It's a mouthful, and it takes me about a lecture, which is an hour and 20 minutes in my grad seminar to explain how it works for program repair. So I'm not going to do it in detail. I will just give you the intuition. So the idea here is that we have a fixed set of functions or operators, so maybe plus, minus, multiply. Maybe we have a couple more. Maybe we've encoded some of the libraries in the standard C library, right? But like. We just have a fixed set of operators, and those are the components. And we're going to synthesize code. We're going to construct our query to an SMT solver in a very particular way that is only allowed to use those operators. And it, it needs to combine them in a way that satisfies the constraints imposed by the test cases. That's the Oracle-guided part. So in this example, um, this kind of synthesis can totally handle it. Um, it will return a function that looks like this, upsep plus 100 would satisfy those constraints imposed by the test cases. Um, and it turns out that that's the correct answer, which is cool. The way that we encode that synthesis problem is alighted um, for somewhat dubious brevity. Like I said, I think it's cool. Um, and there's a really interesting innovation there for how to do it for repair. So you should read the paper. Or actually read the paper two years before it because it explains it really super duper well. Now you might be wondering, but Claire, they talked an awful lot about forests. The word forest is all over this paper. Why? You have not used the word forest, nor have you used the word trees. I don't understand. This is a legitimate concern. Um, remember in our example, I said that I was going to focus on a single expression and a single test case. So we collected constraints over paths through that one expression. We can actually do this for multiple expressions. Um, and then we're just collecting paths that touch different expressions with symbolic values. So here's one angelic path, right? I've just abstracted this program to be just three expressions that we might be reasoning about symbolically. So here's one path, and we know that that passes the test case. But if we go to your left, um, if we just go through E1, E2, that won't pass the test case, so we don't have to worry about it, et cetera. You get the point. The point of the whole forest thing is that we can collect these paths and combine them all into one forest of angelic paths and then combine all of them for the purposes of synthesis. Um, the neat part is that the size of this forest is independent of the size of the program. It's only related to the number of expressions that you're considering as symbolic at a time. Um, so this is an instance in which we've modified reasoning so that it's only reasoning about the increment that we're working on, right? We only care about the change in the behavior and not the behavior of the entire program, which means that we've taken synthesis, something that historically can only apply to very small programs, and made it be useful in the context of a very large program. And this idea about reasoning about just the size of the increment and not the entire program is one of the key things that has allowed this technique as well as heuristic techniques to scale to programs of non-trivial size. Um, it appears basically in all kinds of places in program repair. And this may seem kind of intuitive now, like, well, yeah, of course we only need this many paths, but it's one of those innovations that just seems really obvious, I think, in retrospect, but at the time wasn't. Um, Angelix is built on previous work called Direct Fix, 
that have very slightly different goals but very similar underlying mechanics, except that the constraint it had to solve basically encoded the semantics of the entire program or entire function, um, so it totally didn't scale. And this does, which is one reason I think this paper is awesome. So, I want to frame a discussion of results kind of comparatively. Um, I've painted this world in which we have heuristic techniques and symbolic techniques. There are many more besides the two that I've told you. Um, but I can give you a flavor for the kinds of problems that we're concerned with and how we evaluate them and show you some comparison. There are three major issues in program repair, three major problems we're trying to solve. Um, the first is scalability. I kind of hinted at this. We want to apply to real programs that are really big. The second is output quality, which is that we want to make patches that are good. This is a major problem. I will come back to it because it has no suitable definition yet. Um, and the third is we want to make a whole bunch of different kinds of patches for different kinds of bugs and different kinds of programs. Um, like I hinted at at the beginning, you know, I couldn't tell my boss I only fix buffer overflows. I had to fix kind of any bug that came my way. And our real goal in program repair is to come up with techniques that can be equally expressive. And this is the first place where I think you can at least imagine the differences between the, what the techniques can do. Something like GenProg operating at the statement level is just going to construct different kinds of patches as compared to Angelix that can only manipulate these particular kinds of expressions in combination. Now there is overlap in the types of bugs they can fix, but you can still, you know, I think just even looking at the level of representation tells you that there has to be some kind of difference in expressive power, and at least in what is produced. Um, semantic techniques also tend to be limited in the power of their underlying symbolic reasoning engines. So if a, if a symbolic execution engine can't handle it, um, semantic techniques can't either. So that's a, a limitation on expressive power, but at least one that can be sort of painted as an orthogonal problem. So as those techniques get better, the repair techniques built on them also get better. Okay, so the first evaluations of program repair focused on both of these two issues, scalability and expressive power. Um, and I wanna stop just for a second on scalability because for a long time this was the problem. As I hinted at with semantic techniques, you know, synthesis doesn't work for programs with millions of lines of code. You can't synthesize that big of a program. Um, similarly, for genetic programming, uh, it tends to focus on things no larger than about 15 or 20 expressions in a tree of a program. Um, so I think we forgot in, in the intervening years how hard this was to do it scalably. So scalability was the dominant concern for a long time and why we ignored output quality for so long. Spoiler alert. I'm gonna show you a table full of bugs and programs that I don't want you to try to read. I will tell you what's happening. Okay, the first half of this table consists of bugs and programs that appeared in the first paper I gave you on GenProg. Um, the back half has a bunch of more programs, bigger and better programs that appeared subsequently. The approach here to evaluate was basically to troll places like bug track um, and bug databases to try and find a variety of bugs in a variety of different kinds of programs and show that GenProg could fix them. So there are many programs here, right? Um, they have a bunch of different kinds of bugs. And the whole point is that GenProg could fix them in about under seven minutes on average, which was super cool. We fixed them, hooray. Um, now this is the evaluation in a lot of papers in program repair. I'm picking on myself, but I'm picking on everyone else too because this is what we did for a long time. Say, we have a technique, it can fix bugs, here are bugs that we fixed. But it never really satisfied anyone. Um, I give talks like that with tables like that um, and inevitably after the talk, someone in from the back of the room would come up to me and say something like, okay, that was super cute. That part was either implied or, or actually said. But you know, what if I actually, you know, I'm a real human who works on real code. What if I gave you the last 100 bugs my real developers had to deal with? How many could GenProg actually fix? Which is a really good question, because maybe I just showed you the only 18 bugs that GenProg's ever made patches for, right? <laughs> and you have no way of knowing that, and I'm trying to be a good scientist. Um, so this kicked off an 18-month period of my life of drama, and I, I don't think I realized how sort of how much confession I would be doing in this talk, but it's still true. 18-month um, period of my life where I, we were constructing a data set to answer this question, which at that point totally did not exist. I wanna tell you about the data set really, really quickly, um, just to give you a more complete picture of the way we've been evaluating this and the kinds of numbers that GenProc puts up, um, but also because subsequent papers in this space often use the same scenarios that we constructed in that data set for the purposes of comparative evaluation. So if you read the Angelix paper, you'll have noticed that they evaluate on a subset of some unnamed data set that was cited somewhere in the middle of the bibliography, and you probably didn't read it because why would you? 
Um, that data set grew out of the data set that I'm telling you about right now. So to understand where those bugs came from, you need to understand the drama of my life. So we just wanted a big set of important bugs in real programs that was indicative in some way. Um, and so we want to just get like the last 100 bugs or whatever that were fixed in a bunch of open source programs and see how many we could fix under controlled circumstances. Um, this was actually just pre-GitHub, um, which means we were actually trolling SourceForge a lot, which at the time, people were like, oh yeah, SourceForge, and now they look at me like I'm nuts. Um, <laughs> most of the projects we studied, actually most of the projects you'll see in the next table have, have moved to GitHub since. Um, but that's where we were. We were on SourceForge, and we started with a bunch of projects today, and then we just went back in time through source control looking for commits where test case behavior changed. And that gave us about 105 bugs. This has since been, we got up to 185 that we then tried to fix under controlled circumstances. I'm about to show you another table I don't want you to read. Um, these numbers are a little bit old, um, but just we took this historical approach and we showed that under controlled circumstances, and this is pretty consistent, GenProg fixes about half the bugs you throw at it, and it does so in a reasonable amount of time. We did this um, on early EC2, and I have some hilarious stories about that. I will spare you. Um, but we did that so that we could measure how much it actually cost and show that those costs were human competitive, which was the point of that evaluation. But you should recognize the names of some of these programs. Um, things like the PHP interpreter, which is amazingly well tested, which I think is funny. Um, <laughs> Wireshark, right? You've heard of Wireshark. Um, you know, it turns out compilers tend to be easy to test, so it may be easier to find bugs in. Um, but these are real programs. They have up to several million lines of code in them, and we showed that we could fix bugs in them. That data set is what appears in Angelix. Angelix used a subset of those scenarios for its evaluation. They put in a whole bunch of numbers in the paper. This is just one of those charts where they're comparing Angelix to another technique called SPR, which appeared between GenProg and Angelix, also a good paper that you should read, um, and also GenProg. And so this graph is just showing you what they call repairability, so which bugs they can, how many of the bugs in each program they, set they can fix. I don't really like this graph because um, it's normalizing the number of defects in each program. So there's way more PHP bugs, for example, than GMP bugs. There's only two GMP bugs, um, and I don't know, we're like 70-something PHP bugs at this point. But you know, what they're telling you is that AngelX can fix a whole bunch of bugs better and more than other techniques can, and that message is still true, kind of regardless of the axes. And that's where those scenarios came from. So if you were like, why Wireshark? The answer is because I could find bugs in them in, in it in 2011. But then, at this point, because they were already winning, right? This is one of the reasons I love this paper. I really love this paper. Um, they synthesized a patch for Heartbleed. I also love that bugs have logos now because it makes slides easier to make. Um, so they're like, hey, we fix all these bugs. We do it better than previous techniques. The, bu the patches are of higher quality than previous techniques. And also, let's synthesize a patch for a previously unautomatically repaired uh, vulnerability that everyone knows about that has a nifty logo and that everyone cares about, and they totally did. Um, it's a little bit different from the developer patch. If you stare at it for a bit, you can convince yourself that it's functionally equivalent. Um, it's really cool. It's really cool. Anyway, moving on. Um, so back to making strong statements. Um, scalability is basically solved. Um, heuristic techniques have been there for a long time. We started building that big data set of million line programs in 2011, um, and other techniques in that space have been able to operate them over them for a long time. Angelix takes semantic techniques up to about that level. It's not fully automated. You have to do some work to make your input fit nicely with it, but they showed that they could fix bugs at the same scale as heuristic techniques could. Um, and expressive power, we're still fixing a variety of bugs. I think this is still an open challenge, and it's something we're beginning to worry about more, but we're not as worried about it these days. Um, the thing we are worried about is repair quality. Um, this problem actually isn't unique to program repair, automatic repair. Um, you know, patches come from humans all the time, and we need to know if they're any good. Something like 20% of developer-produced patches are reverted, right? Humans also write garbage. Um, we just want to know if a patch is good, no matter where it comes from. Um, it's also not a new problem, and in fact, it's something that our concern with goes back to the start of our work in program repair. Um, and I have a bunch of really hilarious stories about the terrible things that go wrong when you start randomly changing like the Python interpreter on EC2. Um, but something I think that's more informative for this discussion actually goes back to the second bug we ever tried to fix with GenProg, so I'm gonna tell you about it. 
So the second, first bug we ever fixed was that GCD bug. Um, the second bug was in a 6,000 line, very bare bones web server called null HTTPD. Um, the version 0.5.0 had a remote exploitable heap-based buffer overflow in the handling of post. Somebody forgot to check that a user provided input was greater than zero before calling malloc with it. Nice thing about it is you can write a failing test case really easily, spin up your server, run the exploit, check if the server's still running. If it's not, you fail. Neat. So now what we need is a bunch of passing test cases, and we can try out our prototype and see if it can fix the bug. So what does a web server do, right? A web server gets some stuff. So get index.html, you know, get not found.html. Okay, feeling pretty good. Audience participation time. What happened? We have a bug in post. We have a bunch of get requests. We want to pass some test cases. Of course that's what happened. <laughs> It actually happened really quickly. <sighs> yeah. Um, so we felt stupid, naturally, and we added a non-crashing post test case, and actually the prototype found a much better patch very quickly. Um, took a bit longer than just deleting post did, but, you know, whatever. But the point, it illustrates the point, right, which is that when your test case is your objective function, um, your test suite quality really matters because it controls the quality of the thing you're getting out of it. Now, I'm willing to fall on my sword at this point and claim that a patch that deletes posts is better than a patch that does nothing, because at least I can get static content, right? But I, I'm not gonna lie to you and pretend that I think that's as good as like fixing post, <laughs> right? That's definitely better. But the problem is this whole thing begs the question of what the heck a high quality patch is anyway. And I get into this argument with people all the time, right? And all sorts of options are put forward, but there's no sort of principled answer in the research literature that I know of that actually answers it. So one possibility is that we want our patches to be understandable by humans, right? That would be a good thing for a patch to have. Although I will point out that I had no problem understanding the post deleting patch, right? That wasn't the issue. One thing that's been put forward, and you may have seen this in the Angelix paper, is we might say that a patch that doesn't delete is good. And I just can't get past go to fail for this one. And notice actually that Angelix can't fix go to fail. That is a really bad bug that you fix by deleting a line. So I don't want to say that a, patch, that a patch can't delete, because deletion is sometimes OK. We might say, well, maybe it should do the same thing that the human did or would do, but humans are often wrong. And how close does it have to be anyway? Like, I'm totally comfortable with their heart bleed patch, even though it wasn't the same. So I don't want to use the human as the only arbiter. We might say it has to address the cause and not the symptom, which I think is getting closer. I'm telling you this story because it informs, actually, the evaluation that takes place in the third paper, which I may or may not get to in detail. Because this idea of how do we actually assess the quality of the patches that come out of this technique is now all over the literature as we try and figure out that answer and try and develop techniques that make better patches. And the reason we haven't done that yet is because we don't yet know how. Um, but one proposal that we've put out is to measure quality of patches based on the degree to which the results generalize to a second set of tests. So if you're, you know, in machine learning, when you're evaluating a model, you test it on a separate set of data then you trained it on to do, assess overfitting. So if you look at program repair this way, the tests that are used to build the repair are the training tests. I mean, this is classic machine learning. And then you could have a second set of tests to assess correctness. Let's imagine that we just had a data set of programs for which we had two test suites. We could then use that to evaluate the degree to which one technique makes better patches than the other, right? It would be super cool if it weren't totally impossible. <laughs> And it's totally impossible because it requires two high quality full coverage test suites and we don't even have one, um, <laughs> even for PHP. So it's sort of a problem when it comes to evaluation. Um, we did come up with a data set that sort of gets at this. Um, we had a, I have a friend who's a professor at UC Davis, um, and they have an intro programming class where students can submit multiple responses to simple programming assignments to a Git server, where they're then run on some test cases and told the students, you know, oh, you pass five out of six, try again. So now we have multiple buggy versions of multiple programs, and because the assignments are really small, we can actually make two full coverage test suites for them. So we can use this, actually, to assess the degree to which one technique makes better patches than the other, and we did that. Um, there's a whole paper on it, I'll spare you. The short version is just that both tools produce patches that overfit to the training set. If they didn't, both of these bars would be all the way at 100 all the time. So this is one way we can reason about the quality of patches that are produced. It's a little bit synthetic because the programs are small, but at least we have a lot of them, I guess. Um, and I'm telling you about it so that you can understand the evaluation we do in that third paper. Fun fact before we get there, though, the tools actually did about as well as the freshmen did. Um, 
freshmen also overfit. And some people say, like, well, yeah, well, of course you do as well as the students. But, like, actually, students have brains. So I felt pretty good about this. <laughs> I really did. I'm an optimist. It's worth mentioning that this is not unique to heuristic techniques, um, sort of unpublished work. We looked at how Angelix does on this data set and found that um, the data set we've called as intro class because it's an intro class programs. They also overfit. Um, Angelix was looking at functionality deletion um, in their quality assessment. Like I said, deletion makes me uncomfortable, but it's kind of getting at the same thing. And they found that Angelix actually does a much better job of this on the patches that they looked at. And here, higher is worse. So the lower you are in the bar, the less functionality you're deleting. So I, one more thing worth mentioning on Angelix. I actually think part of this problem is really easy to fix because one observation we had was that um, what it's doing is synthesizing um, overly constricted uh, conditions on if checks. So they never do like a less than or equal to. It's only ever a less than. And so that's something you can fix with heuristics. That said, um, this is kind of sad, right? Because I've just spent 40 minutes telling you, hey, we're going to fix bugs in your programs by using test cases. And I told you to be skeptical of the test cases thing at the beginning, and I assume you were. But like, still, I was telling you kind of a happy story. Um, and so maybe, maybe it's actually really sad. Um, maybe it's a sad story. Um, but I actually, I am, I am an optimist. I think it's not a sad story, and that we have a bunch of options. So option one is to develop techniques that are more likely to generalize. So now that we have this one idea about how to assess at least quality experimentally, maybe we can use it to guide the construction of new techniques. So I'm going to give you a 35-second summary of what happens in that third paper. The reason I'm going to do that is because that third paper starts to combine heuristic and semantic techniques with this goal in mind, which is why it was chosen as the third paper. In general, the way we want to try and do this is by challenging our assumptions, basically. Um, I want to pause for a second just as a scientist and admit to you, again, I'm being very confessional, that I've made an awful lot of assumptions in my work to date and they've all been wrong. Um, one of them, and it's an assumption that sh is shared by many, many papers and techniques in this space, is that patches are like kittens and smaller is better. Right? We want to make as few changes as possible. That's why GenProg has this patch minimization step at the end that I totally skipped in my explanation of it because it's boring. The idea is that patches should be short, right? And short patches are more likely to not do bad things. Angelix encodes this explicitly in its encoding of the problem space. It wants to make small changes. It's built on a technique that that's all it was trying to do. Everyone thinks this is true. The idea that's being pursued in that third paper is that what if instead of trying to make small changes, uh, we instead replaced entire regions of code that were buggy? Because if we did that, if maybe we replaced a function with a whole other function that was written by a person, we might be able to more correctly capture the overall desired logic. Humans who write blocks of code have a sense of what's going on. So the principle here is to use human written code to fix bugs at a higher granularity level and that that might lead to better quality repairs. So we're using symbolic reasoning to search for code at that higher granularity level. Symbolic reasoning to search, so semantic reasoning to generate a bunch of patches and see if any of them work, generate and validate plus semantic, and the story comes full circle. Um, i tell you more about that, but I'm running out of time and I'm already going fast. So instead I'll just say, I won't even tell you how it works. It doesn't matter. Point is, the patches are much higher quality. Win, which is good. Um, the problem is that we're back having a scalability problem, right? This is only on those small programs. So we're going back around in circles. And such is science. Oh, well. So I actually don't think that we are in a sad place, right? I think that's not the place we're in. I think we're in a happy place. Um, I also really like this kitten, and I wanted to show her to you because she's cute. Um, the other option for how we might address this problem is to understand and reason about the circumstances under which perfection is not required. I'll tell you a really quick story about some more results from 2012 from another paper. Um, I've done these case studies on these patches to see what effect they had, practically speaking. And what we did was we took a bunch of servers, um, Lighty, Knowledge GPD, and then a PHP application that ran on a web server, and we took patches to those servers. Um, and this patch was bad. Like the PHP patch explicitly turned off functionality because we couldn't find a patch that didn't turn off functionality automatically. So what we did is we ran these programs with indicative workloads taken from a day of requests to a, an academic department's website. We patched them, and then we looked at how many of the requests were lost post-patch as an indication of how many indicative users would be affected by a patch in this context. Um, 
and the upshot, to give you one more table you shouldn't read, if you look at the last line, is that it totally didn't matter. It didn't matter. Like we turned off something that PHP previously did in string manipulation and nobody noticed. And nobody noticed, not just because PHP is ridiculous, because it is, um, <laughs> but because bugs often happen in corner cases. <clears throat> bugs happen in under-tested functionality that people don't use as much, because if people used it, they would have noticed the bug sooner and it wouldn't be there. So the reason I think this is a sort of a viable option is to try and understand sort of the user's needs, um, the developer intention, the common cases. When is it okay to turn off functionality? I don't want to punt and say that deletion is okay, but I think that deletion is okay sometimes. And this is an indicate, it's sort of a, a good example of why I think software engineering is worth studying. Um, something I thought was interesting that Mario started with in the last talk was saying, you know, algorithms and computer systems, absent their human users, are, you can't study them that way, right? You need to think about humans. The reason I like software engineering is because it's programming languages and semantics and formal reasoning, but with the human involved. Um, and thinking about the user context and the developer intention can help us understand what we actually need our systems to do to be satisfied with them and when they are at an acceptable level of quality. Okay, so I will summarize. Um, I told you a story about myself and my youth. Um, and I did that to motivate a high level picture on how work in automatic program repair works. I told you about Genprog, it uses randomness to do it. I told you about Angelix, one of my favorite papers of all time, I'm not lying, um, which uses symbolic reasoning to do it. These two are indicative of techniques in two broad classes of program repair. So if you read papers, they probably fall into one of these two categories. I told you about a big data set that we've used to evaluate all of these techniques. And then I talked about how tragic uh, the quality problem is. And if any of you have an idea of what a good patch is, I spend a lot of time asking people when I meet software engineers, what's a good patch? I'm like, okay, when you're reviewing a pull request, what are you looking for? Come tell me, because I really want to know. Um, and then I put a picture of a kitten because I'm a millennial and I cannot help myself. <laughs> and also she's cute. So that was a lightning fast introduction. I am at 49 minutes and 33 seconds and they told me 50, so I'm feeling pretty good about myself. And I think that we have time for a few questions. So fire away. Hi, Claire. Uh, super Hi. excellent talk. Um, so I think this is really interesting. And I was wondering, I, I had a comment on your last question about is deleting OK? Um, I, I work at Twitter, and in our last hack week, I actually just decided to like delete 68,000 lines of code. And that Good was actually you. a big win in our code base. <laughs> so deleting is great. And I think it would actually be really interesting to, I don't know if there's work on it, analyze large software systems for what is unused, because especially in distributed systems, they tend to take down the code base. So this uh, is, I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, but actually this is a principle that I think is beginning to be explored in the security community, which is to say, can we take a program and figure out what's never executed by an indicative workload and just delete the rest? Yeah. Um, so you're making me feel better. No, I, I think that's actually like a really difficult problem in industry when you get these large scale code bases and you're like, I don't know, it like, like I worked in the games industry for a while too and there was like literally this block of code that was like unknown but needed and so like no one would delete it because we were all too scared. Um, but what I also thought was super interesting is there's a lot of work, especially in the distributed correctness space, uh, this is all like sort of like local single program, not mm -hmm. going over a network, about defining invariance and is there anything in sort of like bug patch fixing on using invariance instead of test cases to generate patches? So yes, actually, and I should have caveated the whole talk with um, there is work in um, sort of the PL and SE community that looks at specified code. Um, so if we have contracts, for example, let's say we're writing our program in a language called Eiffel, which is specified, um, that is, uh, so there is work that does that. The trick is you need to have specifications. Um, so there is, I think, some promising directions that we can take in learning invariants and then using those to inform inference. As soon as we have any kind of annotation about what desired behavior is, life gets not like easy, but much easier. The trick is just getting them. So if I can convince you all to start specifying your code, we can make it much better for you. Um, you just like need to do it. Um, so uh, yeah, I think there's some promising approaches. People are more likely to specify their code now than they were because we're having these more lightweight annotation languages that allow that. Um, and there's been advances in invariant learning and an in inference to try and learn some of those annotations to help people make them. And I think that that's another really important step because it's the, you can inform all kinds of reasoning then to fix bugs. Okay, I have a question. Are there semantics that you like existing or not? 
that are amenable to program repair or semantics to avoid or designs to avoid? So that's a really, the question is, are there semantics that are very good for informing program repair? Um, and if, are there some that should be avoided? Um, and my opinion on this has changed within the last six months, which makes it tricky to answer. Uh, my answer used to be that I don't have a strong reason to believe that one language is any better than the other. Um, we have actually tried GenProg at multiple levels of abstraction. Um, it works at the assembly level, it works on C. Um, but I'm beginning to see as we're trying to apply it to Java for various reasons that the modifications that work in C don't work nearly as well in Java um, because Java's compiler cares, basically, about what you do. And that means that it's, it's harder to, it's less mutationally robust is the phrasing we would use, um, to random changes. And so it's harder to evolve a set of changes that are legal. If you think about it, in Java, if you have code after a return statement that's dead, um, it won't compile. But maybe you randomly inserted that return statement because you're trying something, and if you just had that return statement and not the dead code, the fix would be good. So in this framework of evolving changes, right, maybe what we want to do is insert the return and then delete the dead code, which is something we know how to do all that, right? I'm just saying that like, the framework of the statement level modifications doesn't necessarily port directly between languages that have stronger, let's say, static semantics. Um, which I think just means that we need to reason about those semantics as we think about the modifications that are legal. In some respects, the fact that C's compiler lets you get away with murder makes it easier to fix. Um, but I don't want to encourage a universe in which we're just writing everything in C because I don't think that's the solution. Um, I think the solution really is to think about the implications that stronger or different semantics have for the kind of modifications that are performed on code and use that to inform a system that selects or instantiates different kinds of fixes. So the answer is no, but I think it matters. I'm kind of language agnostic, actually. Sorry, but I might kind of get better at shorter answers. People ask me short questions, and I just go on forever. Uh, so one of the questions I have is uh, sometimes one of the hardest things with dealing with a bug is actually writing the failing test case yes. that isolates it. Um, yes. Do you have any hope that you can hold out to us uh, on that front, especially, but, but I also ask because as continuous integration and automated testing becomes more widespread, the number of software releases that actually have failing tests in them is gonna go down, and so. Yeah, so. so I think that this is a huge problem, and it's a thing that we are definitely punting on. I'm like, oh yeah, you have a test case, right? And like, half the time, by the time you get to a test case, you know what the problem is, right? Um, so I think you kind of started answering my question, which is um, these automated tested and, and continuous integration frameworks um, add a lot of automation to the testing process. Um, there is significant work in automatic test generation um, to help find defects. That's often the goal in automatic test generation research. Um, and any kind of really program analysis that looks for bugs and tries to fix them. There's this whole body of work, both in SE and PL and in security, not both, it's you know, in all these different areas that tries to look for bugs. Um, the trick is, can we convert those into inputs that are suitable for this kind of technique? So some of that will involve changing these techniques to take different kinds of inputs, but some of it's also just an integration problem. So I think there is hope. Um, I don't think we'll ever get rid of the need for developers. That's not the goal. The goal is to lift the level of abstraction that you have to worry about as a developer, so that you're not chasing down Ukrainian for three days. Um, but yeah, I'm thinking a lot of that automated tooling can just hook directly into this, and then your life gets easier. If I could give you a patch and a test case for a bug that I found automatically, like, that would be a really good day for everybody. Question. Um, cool work, fantastic presentation, thanks. Uh, do you have any papers you love that look at these kind of approaches where you don't have reproducible failures, where you have Heisenbugs or maybe not even hard to find, but still random uh, non-determinism? Non so the question is asking me about non-deterministic bugs and if there are papers I love that look at them. Um, so yeah, that is an assumption that I should have made explicit, and I don't know if I did, which is that we're assuming deterministic failures. There is work in 
reasoning about concurrency errors and in finding them especially. People do a fair amount of like model checking actually is looking at how to find concurrency errors. There is a little bit of work in how to resolve atomicity errors. So single, error, single line atomicity errors coming out of the University of Wisconsin and the group of Ben Liblet. I think that work is really cool. Um, I don't know if it's, you know, we're not quite there yet, I think as a community in terms of being ready for prime time. The hardest part about those is reproducing them though. Um, and a lot of times, you know, if you reproduce it, if, you know, it, it's this exact issue, which is that as soon as you know how to make it happen, you know how to fix it. Um, I think that's kind of one of the next steps here, and I actually am not sure how we're going to solve it, because the real problem there is in the testing and in the witnessing and in finding the bug, and not so much necessarily in the fixing of it. There's some work. I don't hate it, but I, I wouldn't say it. It doesn't get me as excited. Thank you, Claire. Thank you.